questions the uh, questions were taken from uh, a textbook called single best answers in surgery yes <laughs> okay uh, uh, yeah and uh, some questions are are not very good also the quality of mcqs uh, so uh, we can just sort of uh, this is as a sort of a practice and introduce how these mcqs and single best answer questions are uh, by now sir uh, can you hear me uh, yes we can hear you about uh, 212 uh, students have uh, completed the the their responses are still coming up. Uh, we can start with the first question. Answers. Uh, yeah. Answers. Sorry? This is the question. Uh, what of the following is not a risk factor for ghost on formation? Oh, uh, uh, Pinter, do you have the answers? Yes. How, how they have answered? You have the results, yeah. Yeah. responses? Yeah. <laughs> ghost on formation. Uh, when you take smoking, about almost 50% uh, has... Uh, Taken it as uh, false, more than just more than fifty percent. But, uh, but uh, so I think the data is a bit inconclusive on smoking as uh, respect of a goldstone formation. Sorry, can you hear me? We can hear you. So, Musa, we can hear you. All right. All right. Uh, usually, you don't get uh, MCQs like this. Uh, this is not a, either MCQ or not a single best answer because there is only one answer for this stem, no? Uh, and uh, single best answers all are likely to be true and one answer is uh, very true. Uh, so anyway, sort of uh, we can use this to discuss uh, uh, the risk factors for gold stones. Uh, so uh, they can hear me, no? We can hear you. Hello? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Hello? Yeah, so uh, here the answer is uh, smoking is the uh, false answer. Uh, what, what of the following is not a risk factor? It's not a risk factor, it's smoking. Now, uh, when we take pregnancy, it is, uh, you all know, uh, we call sort of uh, fertile, fatty females of 40s uh, uh, are the sort of... Uh, are having higher risk of developing gold stones. Uh, so pregnancy is a risk factor. Uh, Crohn's disease, now when we, when we uh, uh, consider the pathophysiology of forming gold stones, now cholesterol and bilirubin, that is unconjugated bilirubin, are the things which doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't stay uh, soluble uh, for form in the bile. So to keep them in the soluble form, uh, you need one thing is oh. if the bile salts lecithin goes down the proportion in proportions uh, by tend to uh, form stones uh, 
so bile salts getting reabsorbed in the terminal ilia. Uh, so things like Crohn's disease, terminal ileal resection, if it is here, uh, that is also causing uh, gallstones. So Crohn's disease, terminal ileal resection uh, reduces reabsorption of bile salts. So when bile salts are less, the cholesterol and uh, cholesterol tend to form stones. Common stones are cholesterol predominant stones. So again, sort of diet high in fat uh, is also leading to uh, high cholesterol levels, increased cholesterol in bile and uh, stone formation. Uh, contraceptive pill is also known to uh, risk factor of developing gold stones. Uh, so it is a simple question, sort of just uh, assess the uh, baseline knowledge uh, of uh, what factors leading to gold stone formation. Shall we just discuss a bit more about the formation? Uh, because now we, we, talk, we talk about all these risk factors, uh, smoking, yeah. pregnancy, yeah, but yeah. What, what what kind of a risk do they have? Like, is it not when you when you say uh, 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 if, let's say we we we, we talk about uh, smoking and oral cancer? Who is that? Is is it a yeah? Is that kind of a risk? Are we talking about or are we talking about maybe there is no some no no kind of risk? no. This is a theoretical risk. As well as sort of this has been shown also. Now, yeah. Now, uh, uh, but I, uh, I I forgot to tell you now when when any stone formation in any system there are three main factors. One thing is uh, uh, stasis, infection, and uh, the anatomical abnormalities, those things leads to stasis, obstruction leads to stasis. Uh, then the constituents. So the bile, it is called the lithogenic bile. Uh, so there are certain factors which tend to keep constituents in liquid form. Uh, and when this balance goes off, they forms, they tend to form stone. Uh, so uh, as I said, increase cholesterol, increase uh, unconjugated bilirubin, tend to increase uh, gold stone formation. So any factors like uh, uh, high fat diet, obesity, all these things tend to increase cholesterol levels. Uh, so tend to increase gold stone formation. So factors which reduce uh, the other factors which in favor of keeping in solution, like uh, bile acids, bile salts, terminal ileal resections, Crohn's disease, then uh... hello, aren't here? Yeah, uh, uh, you are lying to him. Uh, aren't here, you sir? But uh, until until he, the line comes up. Are there any other students from this, uh, other questions from the students about the stone formation, gold stones and its formation? Well, how about the uh, use of alcohol if the patient has having um, hypercholesteremia and if the patient is taking uh, statins? Yeah. So uh, has it for uh, advanced age, male gender? How about those six? Uh, uh, now, all these are actually theoretical risks that you are talking about. Uh, yes. We are not actually we are not actually looking at uh, you know very strong uh, very very strong association, but there is a theoretical possibility when you look at the principles of stone formation, the things that we we uh, said when there is a stasis due to obstruction or maybe there is, for some reason when there is a stasis and when there is a nidus that acts as a stone. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, starting forming point, or else when there is a problem, increase some problem with the constra uh, concentration, uh, where there is uh, the solvent is reduced, or when there is uh, 
um, increase concentration of the substrate. So all when when these kind of imbalances happen, you get stone. So that based on those principles of stone formation, uh, these these uh, uh, these uh, uh, things have come up. This this list has come up, but mm -hmm. the risk is actually not very high. So this is actually not very high. Just because you let's say just because you stop oral contraceptives, it does not really make a big difference. So so this is actually a theoretical risk that we are talking about in practical terms. Yeah. This says abstinence of alcohol causes, uh, I mean, it has an increased risk factor. I, I think this is a very absurd list because abstinence <laughs> of alcohol. <laughs> so let's say, when in that case, people who are not taking alcohol should, should not do so. so. So it's a very theoretical risk that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so this is actually good for, um, you know, people come and ask you, okay, what should I, I uh, my father had a stone. Uh, uh, stones, what should I do to prevent stones? What you say is there's nothing much you can do. Uh, even though there's a list of things that you see in practical terms, it is not really important. Uh, but this is actually a kind of questions. Uh, actually, you don't nowadays we don't ask these kind of questions because there is no real practical importance in this question. Uh, and in this question, uh, Pinto, can you just go back to the question? Hello. Yeah. Uh, so no, no. I, we were just discussing about the uh, degree of these risk factors. How much it can? Uh, uh, what are the kind of risk that you're talking about? Because uh, your alignment talk. Um, and so just uh, want to highlight that this MCQ. Uh, go yeah. to the stem, uh, Pinto. Can you go to the stem? Uh, uh, stem. The following is not a risk factor for goldstone formation. You know, we now you don't get. You don't get these kind of questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that that's what I told them in the uh, very beginning. Yes. Very poor quality MCQ. <laughs> uh, they will never get uh, for SBA or for a true false thing something like this. And so I I think also now asking a question like this in a MCQ there is no actual for me there is no real practical benefit in of this question. I mean these are very tight. Yeah. not very clinical relevant uh, risk factor you are just these are just theoretical risk factors that you're talking about and and yeah. uh, let's say someone comes and a patient comes to you and uh, yeah, and and uh, let's say that uh, uh, this patient's um, uh, uh, sister had a stone gold stone uh, operation was done and the patient uh, the, the sister asked okay what uh, uh, can I avoid forming stones? Is there anything that I can do to prevent stones? What will, how will you answer this question, sir? If, so, if a, a, patient, a patient's sister had a, a cholecystectomy, mm -hmm. and the sister asks, okay, uh, to prevent stones, what can my sister do? Yeah, now there are certain things which we know that we can avoid. Uh, now, things like, now, now, if a patient's sister had a hemolytic disease, of course, right? So we know that has a definite risk in developing yes. uh, 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 goldstone disease. And if the if the index patient doesn't have that hemolytic disease, he doesn't have. But if he also do have the hemolytic disease, uh, for example, say thalassemia or fetal cell. Uh, he is also having a higher risk of de developing goldstone disease. Now, things like uh, obesity, uh, uh, being a female, those are now which we can't uh, control them to a significant extent. So there are certain things which we have a control. Now, for example, if we had ileal resection and uh, had this thing or Crohn's disease and had this thing. So we can say this patient had this thing. He had a recognized cause for this goldstones. But others, they may have associated things like high, fi high fi fat diet, which, which is sort of doesn't have a significant impact also. So we don't go in and advise them. Even when the patient comes with goldstone disease, we don't do lipid profile. Uh, though we recognize hyperlipidemia is associated with uh, goldstones yeah. because that association is not very strong. Yeah, actually, these are not risk factors, these are associations. Yes, yes, yes. 
Now, things like hemorrhagic disease, Crohn's, ileal resections, they are real risk factors. Student has asked uh, how uh, Crohn's disease results in uh, formation of uh, gallstones. Yeah, uh, Crohn's disease, terminal ileal resection, both because the bile salts getting reabsorbed mm. back into the system. And bile salts are important in keeping bile in a soluble form. So Crohn's disease, usually it is the ileal, ileum is involved, but you can have Crohn's disease without ileal involvement. So disease ileum, it is similar to non-functioning ileum. So uh, reabsorption of bile salts is less so more and more bile salts are uh, get rid of the body or excreted in the body. So depletion of bile salts. Yes. For the next question, sir. Yeah. Again, not used. Investigations are not used in staging of esophageal malignancy. Hmm. So how have they answered? Me, uh, they have, they are all, uh, almost fifty percent have answered. Media stenoscopy also is uh, used. Uh, is, uh, CT. Yeah. Stenoscopy is not used, so it mm. should be true. So, but uh, around fifty percent, four nine percent is have uh, said that we are using it to stage. Is it visual malignancy? Uh, uh, which of the uh, following investigations are not used in the staging the esophageal malignancy? Mediastinoscopy can be used to stage the mediastinal malignancy because yeah. mediastinal lymph nodes uh, uh, can be detected and some people do harvest it and uh, sub subject it to histology before the resection also. Uh, how would you uh, take up this question? Uh, what are the uh, yeah, answers be. given? Yeah. There would be endoscopy. Pinto? These are the answers. Media stinoscopy. What are the answers here? Yeah. Media stinoscopy. Uh, CECT. Yeah. CECT. Endoscopy. Yes. Endoluminal ultrasound and laparoscopy. Yes, that is the commonly used. Yep. Uh, endoscopy is not used to, to stage. Yes. Endoscopy is not used to stage the disease. That is to diagnose it and take a biopsy because you yeah. can't endoscopic ultrasound. Yes, but but endoscopy is to uh, diagnose the disease, not to stage the disease. The fact that the question is for stage the disease, I think endoscopy is the one which is not used to stage the disease. Yeah, sir. Can you can you tell us now what do you what do you understand by this staging of esophageal cancer? What do you want to stage? What are the things that you want to see when you are staging esophageal yeah. cancer? Yeah. Now, uh, different cancers. Uh, all, most of the cancers we do staging. Uh, uh, with a uh, different, uh, they have a different in importance. Uh, now, as they have seen more colorectal cancers uh, last few weeks, I would say the staging is a very important uh, thing which we do once we diagnose a cancer, right? So once we diagnose, the next step is staging the disease. Uh, and in colon and rectal cancer, especially rectal cancer, staging is done to see whether they are candidates for neoadjuvant uh, treatment. Uh, and colon cancer we do to see whether they have uh, metastatic disease. Metastatic disease doesn't mean it is incurable, but we have to address that disease with a priority than the primary disease in colon and rectal cancer. So because of these two reasons, we want to stage this. 
Now, esophageal cancer it is with a different intent. Again, once it is diagnosed, we want to stage the disease. The simple meaning of staging is to see the extent of the disease, whether the disease is local, this uh, only confined to the index organ, like the esophagus, or it has gone beyond and uh, confined to the regional lymph nodes, or it has metastasized to a distant organ. So those are the main three aspects which we consider when we talk about staging. Uh, simply, whether it is a local disease, local regional disease, or metastatic disease. In esophageal cancer, uh, the most important thing is to see whether it is metastatic disease or not, because if it is metastatic disease, we won't be able to cure it. So, but rectal and colon cancer, metastatic disease doesn't mean it is incurable. Here, the main name to see whether it is treatable disease or not. Then the importance of local regional disease and the local disease also important. Some type of local disease are also not curable. If it is infiltrated to the uh, uh, heart, aorta, major bronchus, Right. So that kind of organ, which is not uh, sacrificable, then also it is not curable. Uh, so involvement of regional lymph nodes are also important uh, to know uh, because now since I think 2010, they have, they have shown definite benefit of new age one treatment. So there are three main aspects of uh, knowing the stage of the disease in esophageal cancer. One thing, the first most important thing is to see whether it is treatable disease or not, or curable disease or not, or resectable disease or not. Uh, then to see whether they are going to be benefited from uh, neoadjuvant treatment or not. So those are the things which we have uh, for, for these reasons, we would like to stage the disease once it is diagnosed. So, so now there comes a problem now, once you get a patient with esophageal cancer, yes. do you do all these tests to, I mean, stage, all these tests to stage the patient or you do only few of them and then you're happy with that? Uh, it is like this. Now, there are certain th things which we do for all patients. Uh, for example, contrast enhanced CT, chest and abdomen, right? So this thing, it is done for all patients because the, the, the commonest site for their uh, developed metastatic disease is lung and the liver. And that will uh, help us to sort of recognize T4 lesions, that is, the locally advanced lesions, which has infiltrated into the major structures like trachea, aorta, uh, vertebral bodies, or heart, uh, uh, inferior pulmonary vein, uh, that kind of structures also. Uh, so CECT, abdomen and chest, and the lymph node state, uh, celiac axis and mediastinum. So this is uh, done in all patients. Now, things like, now, bronchoscopy is also a staging investigation. If there are clinical features to suggest that there is a bronchial invasion, we do a bronchoscopy. If there is a clinical indication to suggest that he has a brain mit, late onset epilepsy or something like that, we may do a, a CT brain as well. Uh, now, the, the, uh, the contrast enhanced CT in detecting metastatic disease is not very accurate in esophageal cancer. And the fact that sort of it is a very complex uh, uh, surgery, which carries a very high operative mortality and morbidity, we can't afford to do this operation without any clear benefits. So uh, some institutes regularly do laparoscopy as well, especially for the lower one-third and gastroesophageal junction tumors to see whether they have metastatic disease, especially 
peritoneal metastatic disease may not be detected uh, with CT scan. And the mediastinoscopy is also done, especially usually in Australia and uh, regularly done in Australia and USA uh, to sample lymph nodes and do uh, new uh, give new adjuvant chemoradiotherapy in a resectable tumor. And most of the uh, 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 guidelines suggest PET CT scan to be done if CCT abdomen and chest is negative and if you are planning for surgery to avoid any uh, uh, occult metastatic disease which couldn't be detected with the uh, conventional contrast enhanced CT. Uh, so we don't do all investigations, but bare minimum is contrast enhanced CT, abdomen and chest, if possible, PET CT as well, if C CT negative, but other things like laparoscopy, bronchoscopy, mediastinoscopy, uh, CT brain, those are optional based on the uh, symptoms. So, so basically what we understand by esophageal cancer staging is we would like to know how bad this tumor is or extent of the tumor. So you would yeah. like to know the local extent of the tumor, the, uh, the extent of local spread, whether the important uh, structures locally are involved like uh, bronchus and the heart that we mentioned. And then we yeah. would also like then that will also limit our uh, possibility of operation or receptability. Yeah. Then yes. we would like to know the lymph node status. If the yeah. certain lymph nodes are involved, then probably you might think of giving neuroadjuvant treatment and sometimes yes. it might be inoperable as well if the certain nodes are involved. Certain, certain nodes are involved. So, yeah. And also you would like to see the, uh, the, see the distal metastasis, especially yeah. the involvement of the liver or the lung metastasis and also uh, the presence of peritoneal metastasis, peritoneal disease which again is a contrary indication for curative surgery. So that is why you yes. would see. Yeah. So in so medical jargon, uh, but yeah. if, we, if, if, if someone say the staging is done to prognostify disease, the disease, right? All what you said sort of Rohan is yeah. uh, uh, included in that mm -hmm. word. Yes. Right? So it's a single word uh, which, which uh, uh, mean all, all what you have uh, mentioned now. Students, uh, you understood it? Yes, sir. So a student has asked, what is the value of MRI in esophageal cancer? Yeah, MRI now, the rectal cancer, MRI plays a big role in staging, especially in the rectal cancer. Fine. But uh, uh, esophageal cancer, the commonest site of metastasis. Now we are we are we are chasing behind metastatic disease. So commonest site of metastasis are lung and the liver. Liver, of course, MRI has a place. But lung, of course, MRI doesn't have a good place. Uh, uh, another answer, another question they have asked is. Uh, in rectal cancer, we don't use laparoscopy as staging test, although in esophageal cancer, we use it. Yes. The incidence of peritoneal metastasis uh, higher in esophageal cancer than in yeah. rectal cancer. So, yeah. You can mute your mute at the meeting. Sorry? Mute Kragan, your. No, no, no. Come on, you have muted. Right. Did I answer that question? Hello? Yeah, I think it's clear. Now, uh, students, I think you all should be asking questions. Um, I mean, KB being telling this repeatedly. Try to answer the questions uh, uh, you know, verbally rather than typing. So that's, a, that's another way of uh, exposing yourself to the stress. Yeah. yeah. Shall we move on to the next question, sir? Yep. Yeah. The following is not a recognized cause of post-operative jaundice following lab call. Mm -hmm. uh, shall we see students' answer? Yeah. 
following is not a recognized cause of forcibility jaundice. The ligation of left hepatic duct, everybody has answered. Oh. Right. Most of them have taken as common hepatic duct ligation as yes, answer. Right. Okay. Uh, which of the following is uh, recognized? Now, uh, there are certain keywords they have used to recognize. Uh, Pinto, can I go to the question? Uh, Yes, sir. You can see now. Uh, recognized cause of the post-operative jaundice following laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, ascending uh, Now, the commonest, no, not the commonest. Uh, the 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 worrying complication of uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy is uh, post-operative jaundice or bile duct injury. Uh, so, now when we take bile duct injuries. Uh, uh, the uh, bile duct injuries are <laughs> little commoner in laparoscopic cholecystectomy than open cholecystectomy, but more, all most of these complications uh, occur in open cholecystectomy as well. Uh, now, uh, they are the open cholecystectomy, of course, we ligate, but here we use uh, clips and diatomy more than uh, uh, open cholecystectomy. Uh, so, uh, ascending, uh, when we take with that background knowledge, the ascending cholangitis. Uh, now, the one, uh, one other common complication, not common, uh, the one other complication following either lap laparoscopic open cholecystectomy is uh, retained stone, a stone which we have missed, which is retained in the uh, common bile duct. But when a, when, the, when a patient comes with, now, when we are investigating a patient for cholecystectomy, one important aspect is to see whether he has got stones in the common bile duct or not. So we do uh, biochemical tests like bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, uh, which will help us to sort of recognize that. We do radiologically assess dilated uh, uh, common bile duct and uh, sometimes you may see a stone in the CBD uh, and even a dilated cystic duct gives us a uh, uh, suspicion that whether he has, a, uh, whether a small stone has escaped through the cystic duct. Then the clinical history like uh, pancreatitis, that means sort of passage of a stone through the uh, duct system or obstructive jaundice, presence of obstructive jaundice. Uh, so these are, there are clinical, biochemical, and radiological uh, uh, clues to suggest that there are stones in the CBD. We do all these things to exclude or to uh, make sure that there are no stones in the duct system. But even after doing all these things, there is about five to 6% chance of still having stones in the common bile duct. Once the gallbladder is removed, right, when the gallbladder is there, the most of the pressure is taken up by the gallbladder. But once it is removed, they tend to develop jaundice very soon, right? Uh, and uh, not only jaundice, when there's obstruction, they tend to develop, on top of that, if they develop an infection, they develop cholangitis. So ascending cholangitis is a possible complication following cholecystectomy. Uh, uh, ligation of uh, left hepatic duct. Now, ligation of, uh, we are supposed to ligate only the cystic duct. So, ligation of any other duct leads to a uh, problem. So, but the commonest problems are the ligation of right hepatic duct. Or there are some accessory ducts or anomalous drug ducts opening directly into the, sometimes the right hepatic duct may open into the cystic duct. Sometimes the, there are ducts directly communicating through, uh, from the liver to the cystic duct. Uh, so uh, these biliary anatomies, they are, they are not very common. They are very rare, but uh, uh, they may, when there are an anomalies, you may, accidentally ligate uh, those ducts 
thinking that it is cystic duct. But left hepatic duct is a very common, uh, very constant one. So most of the anomalies are in the right hepatic duct. So uh, I would leave uh, ligation of the left hepatic duct for the time being. Ligation of the common hepatic duct we have seen, uh, and uh, that is also the, uh, that is a recognized complication. Then goldstone retention, yes. Uh, then thermal injury due to uh, electrocautery, yes. Uh, in laparoscopic cholecystectomy, we tend to use diatomy and other type of cautery is more. So this is not a uh, usually immediate complication, but later on that they can develop the biliary strictures, but they can uh, get thermal injuries, necrosis or slough off of uh, uh, ducts and bile uh, leakage uh, following uh, cholecystectomy. So uh, I think the unlikely event is ligation of the left hepatic duct. Rohan, any input from your side? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, what you basically, it's uh, what you said. Um, uh, so out, uh, uh, I also think that out of all these uh, responses, ligation of the epileptic duct is the most unlikely thing, yeah. but all anything but it is, is also possible, possible. Anything is possible, but that is the most unlikely. But out of all these, I think uh, uh, if you look at real clinical setting, uh, retention of stones is probably a retained stone is uh, is probably the commonest. And yes. if you look at yes. the, the uh, out of other, maybe that's the commonest. And then uh, ligation of the uh, bile duct injury, the commonest type of uh, kind of injury that you get is um, maybe ligation or, or division of the common hepatic duct and maybe then the right hepatic duct uh, yeah, yeah. And, and probably thermal injuries as well. Yeah. Any questions? Shall I go to the next question? Yes. Year old patient is admitted with jaundice. His urine is dark color and stool is pale. On examination, he has a palpable gallbladder. The most likely cause is going into answers. I will have the answer. About what is the majority answer? Majority answer is the tumor of the head of the pancreas. But that is around 42%. So some have oh. had other thoughts as well. Yes. But uh, as a single response, or the majority answered that, no? The last three, sir, this is from starting from now, have, were given as SBAs. They were formulated yeah, yeah. as SBAs. Yeah. Now, now, when you are answering SBAs, important thing is to see you do a cover test after reading this thing now cover test will not give you the answer but most of the time it will give you an answer now 62 year old patient okay fairly old patient is admitted with jaundice they don't say it is uh, him, uh, what type the type of jaundice his urine is dark and stool is pale so it is likely to be obstructive jaundice on examination, there is a palpable gallbladder. Uh, so that uh, that tells us uh, so there is a chronic cause for the obstruction. It's not an acute obstruction. So unlikely to be goldstones. And the obstruction is distal to the cystic CBD junction. So it can't be a higher obstruction. It can't be in the level of the liver. So uh, it can't be in the common hepatic duct. So it is distal to that. Uh, so the most likely cause, so most likely cause is maybe a tumor, unlikely to be due to stones, right? Distal to the uh, uh, cystic CBD junction, okay? Uh, so that is our cover test. Uh, so um, the most likely cause for the jaundice. 
in this fashion ascending cholangitis now this is obstructive jaundice right uh, ascending cholangitis could be uh, the, now any form of obstructive jaundice can can develop ascending cholangitis right uh, right so uh, but it can it is not a primary cause but if if there is no uh, correct answer this answer may, uh, may also be correct right it is going here and there <laughs> where is the second answer right okay impacted stone in the uh, excuse me sir uh, now uh, do you get palpable gallbladder in when you have ascending cholangitis and if the ascending cholangitis is due to obstruction no right okay okay so obstruction is in the distal cbd right now mm. pancreatic tumor patient can have jaundice and ascending cholangitis also right mm. but as said sort of it is unlikely even mm. what about this cause your slow somebody slow is there so is that yeah. the, which is tested here pardon yes it is tested here because stone disease is unlikely here yeah right so i can't see the second response all ah, right impacted stone in the common bile duct now the obstruction the site of obstruction is correct but the stone is unlikely to give rise a palpable gold blood right so tumor of the head of the pancreas so far is the likely response and uh, impacted stone in the neck of the gold bladder yes it can give rise to mucosal palpable gold bladder is okay but they don't get obstructive jaundice so that doesn't fit into that now cholangiocarcinoma is again correct right uh, so impacted uh, sorry tumor of the head of the pancreas and cholangiocarcinoma both are correct and uh, as this is a best of five or sort of single best question i would rather take head of the pancreas because cholangiocarcinoma is not common or head of pancreas tumors are more common than cholangiocarcinoma uh, what do you think rohan you yeah. would be more, yeah yeah ah uh, so difficult uh, difficult question uh uh let's yeah. uh, let's say uh, Now, yeah, uh, very old patient coming with pain. It's basically pain. Looks like a painless jaundice, uh, where there is no description of pain, yeah. but jaundice dark uh, yeah. and pale stool means looks like it's quite a deep jaundice because the pale stools and palpable gallbladder. So it's painless jaundice, the palpable yeah. gallbladder. So ascending cholangitis. I what I felt was it's uh, it's a I'm kind right. of a question that you answer that you put when you don't have a, a response like. or uh, it's actually yeah. not a cause yeah. it's a complication or a effect of obstruction yes. so i think uh, yeah. so we can just uh, take it out because that that's not a cause for um, uh, his symptoms but it is a it's a it is a result of obstruction yes complication so impacted stone in the common bile duct uh, out uh, um well there's a the the no discussion about the pain so it's a painless but sometimes when you have stones in the common bile duct for long period of time uh, sometimes large stones uh, sort of chronic type of presentation sometimes you see patients without coming without pain but with uh, with jaundice but yeah. see that is a uh, less likely event and but and and the palpable gold bladder is against against but the thing is sir uh, but if you really look at it sometimes it is a primary common bile duct stone a stone that yeah. has come up in the common bile duct yeah sometimes you can get a yes. uh, uh, i mean the, the reason why we say yeah. if the yeah, it, it, it's unlikely when because unlikely. primary gold stones in the cbd is yeah. less than 10% yeah it's unlikely yeah but it is not impossible yeah, 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 yeah. If, even ascending cholangitis is not impossible but it is unlikely, unlikely. Thing yes they get yeah yeah so head of the head of the pancreas is a typical presentation so yes. Uh, you this is a kind of patient that you see with head of pancreas tumor. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, 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 then, then we have uh, the impact is on the neck of the gallbladder. But sometimes, typically, how they will present with pain and distended gallbladder. Sometimes, when the stone is impacted in the Hartman's pouch uh, or cystic duct, but sometimes it can give rise to 
um, give rise to jaundice, especially if it is a, a, a wide cystic duct where you get a meat cyst uh, type of presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you might get a bit of a patient with a bit of jaundice, but that jaundice is not very deep jaundice like described here. So it's generally you don't get pale stools. When you get pale stools, that is almost 100% cut out of the bile flow. But in, in Miritsis syndrome, you get a jaundice, but it's not a complete kind of cutoff that you get with uh, Miritsis syndrome. But again, it is not a very likely presentation, but, he, but that is not impossible. Yeah. I think that's a good, uh, good uh, uh, response. Yeah. You get cholangiocarcinoma. So cholangiocarcinoma, it can arise in the intrapancreatic part, it can arise in the extrapancreatic part, <coughs> or, or, or so a common bile duct. Or it can occur in the common hepatic duct, or it can occur in the confluence, or it can occur in the uh, uh, right and left ducts or extrahepatic ducts. Uh, so, but uh, but you will you will get a distension of the gallbladder only if the cholangiocarcinoma involves uh, intrapancreatic part or this, uh, common bile duct, or sometimes even common hepatic duct. You can get uh, distended gallbladder when when the tumor goes down uh, uh, to involve the cystic duct opening. But but out of these two. Uh, the commonest would be uh, the head of the pancreas. So you can you can take the head of pancreas out of these two. These are the two two, two real answers. Yeah. Cholangiocarcinoma or the head of the pancreas. But looking at the probability uh, of uh, getting a patient, I, I think uh, head of the pancreas would be the most likely answer. Yeah. Now, this is a typical uh, best of five question yeah. because all answers are correct. And uh, the two answers are very close, like uh, the head of the pancreas and cholangiocarcinoma. Only a very good student can uh, argue on that, right? The base on the arguments are which is more common, right? uh, but both are pathologically can lead to this uh, problem. Uh, oh, uh, so uh, I would think this is a more postgraduate question, right? Mm -hmm. But for final year exam, if I am sort of forming this, I would give higher cholangiocarcinoma, right? Because unlikely you get a palpable gold better in higher cholangiocarcinoma. Yeah. Uh, is that a better way of altering for final years? Yeah, I think that, that's a better way, yes. To cholangiocarcinoma. And what is the common site for you to get cholangiocarcinoma? Is it the higher or just the CBD? Uh, well, we get we get a lot of patients with distal cholangiocarcinomas. That is Inc uh, incidence wise. Uh, incidence wise, well, actually, distal cholangios are common. Uh, either. Yeah. Okay. So in that sense, if we take it uh, as such, so it's not it's unlikely. It's not unlikely. It is possible, but out of the two uh, two responses, it of the pancreas. It is possible, but but pancreatic tumors are more common. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the what they ask is the most likely cause. So you have to tally the uh, the pathology. You have to tally the incidence, right? The pathology tallies only in the pancreatic head and the cholangio. When you take the incidence, uh, uh, you take the tumor of head of pancreas as the correct answer. Uh, so students, this is a, a good question, a good postgraduate question. Uh, but uh, we can little alter uh, high local angiocarcinoma and sort of uh, get for you, uh, then uh, there is not much of a bias. Definitely, it is the pancreatic head tube. Any questions? Uh, yes. Uh, theoretically, uh, now there are said to be exceptions for the QSCS law. Where a cystic duct stone and yes. a CVD stone is possible. What with are the a exceptions of QSCS law? Yeah. Yeah. One is what I said that uh, yeah. uh, two two stones are there. One in the what cystic duct the, and one in the. Uh, Hello. Yeah. What is the concept behind QSCS law? Uh, students, anyone can. Uh, can anyone answer that question? No one wants to answer. Balan pin to type karlo vatiyala zino andi kiya. 
Yes, type type karla mata digata digata yona me i'm asking them to ask them in person because as rohan sir said they have to you know get used to talking yeah. speaking with us i think that is uh, you should learn that no to ask question yeah. instead somebody has asked about mercy syndrome uh, so do we want to teach, talk about it Yes, Rohan. Can you can you elaborate a little bit about Mirici syndrome? Ah, uh, Mirici syndrome. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. So, what you understand by Mirici syndrome is, ah, uh, when you know that uh, the cystic duct goes and joins to the ah uh, ah uh, ah uh, joins to the common epidemic duct and it becomes uh, the common bile duct, and uh, sometimes you get ah uh, uh, fairly large stones going and ah uh, going and blocking the ah uh, uh, Hartman's pouch. and sometimes the cystic duct uh, is quite variable some of the patients the cystic duct is quite long but in some patient the cystic duct is actually quite uh, short and wide so in these kind of patients when you get a stone impacted uh, in the cystic duct it can partly it can obstruct the cystic duct and it can start protruding into the cystic duct common hepatic duct junction and uh, when the stone blocks the gall bladder it leads to stay, uh, infection so you start getting cholecystitis and uh, and you get uh, get selling uh, edema around the heart uh, around the callus triangle and around the hartman's pouch region so as a result uh, you get uh, obstruction partly because of the impacted stone and partly because of the edema and so that leads to uh, leads to uh, uh, obstructive jaundice so that the obstructive jaundice that you get in mirici syndrome is not very it's sort of not a sort of complete obstruction but there is some sort of obstruction so they have uh, people divide uh, this uh, mirici syndrome into different types depending on the degree of uh, the size of the defect that you get in the uh, in the common bile duct or size of the opening so i think that is not very important for you all but in principle this is what happens in uh, mirici syndrome and it is important to know that sort of in ultrasound they say dilated intrahepatic and the both left and right hepatic ducts uh, but the distal cbd is not dilated here yeah uh, so round what is clad skin tumor so clad skin tumor is uh, is actually again a cholangiocarcinoma when a cholangiocarcinoma arises you can get cholangiocarcinoma in any way in the bile duct system you can get intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma you can get uh, that that is uh, intrahepatic bile ducts can give rise to tumor so these are generally mass forming tumors you get a mass in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas but then when you in then then you can can, can get cholangiocarcinoma in the extrahepatic bile duct system so you can you can get it in the common hepatic duct common bile duct or uh, right and left duct so even the ducts below that uh, or the or the cbd so but these type of tumors they are not mass forming like intrahepatic these are uh, stricturing type of lesions so so uh, what you see is a stricture if you if you uh, when you are talking about extra uh, cholangiocarcinoma in the extra, extra hepatic bile duct system you are talking about a stricturing tumor and you can get this stricture in any part of the extra hepatic bile duct system but when you get a uh, when you get a stricturing tumor in the right duct left duct or the confluence or perihilar region you call it a clad skin tumor so it's a per, uh, uh, name of a person and this can be divided uh, into different degrees depending on whether the both sides are involved whether the right and left are involved whether the uh, whether only the uh, common hepatic duct is involved or the depending on the extent of uh, stricture this can be further divided so but a clad skin tumor is a stricturing or or, or cholangiocarcinoma that arises in the perihilar region yeah again i i just sort of that came into my mind sort of here also you get dilated intrahepatic and the uh, left and right hepatic ducts yeah so in mirc and in any form of question if someone asks sort of the dilated intrahepatic and uh, the uh, right and hepatic ducts and normal distal cbd uh clad uh, skin and mirici should come into the mind so as an answer to the question uh, where where 
why uh, what's the basis behind this QSCS law? One student has uh, written as gallstones that cause uh, chronic inflammation in the uh, gallbladder, and yeah. that leads to fibrosis, and gallbladder is then incapable of distension. All right. Okay. Good. So uh, that's correct. Yeah. Shall we move on to the next question, sir? Yes, please. Uh, a 27-year-old patient presents with a three-month history of increasing difficulty in swallowing. He first noticed the problem when drink drinking fluids, but he is now commonly experiencing it when eating food as well. He has presented as regurgitation of food is becoming a problem and he has noticed unintentional weight loss. A chest radiograph shows a widened mediastinum. What is the most likely diagnosis? So what do they think? Well, 47% of them think that's achalasia. Right, correct. Yeah. Uh, but significant number things uh, otherwise uh, yes. esophageal malignancy also. No? Yes, yes. All right. Okay. <coughs> right. So now you say now uh, this is a twenty seven year old patient. So fairly young. Uh, so at this age, uh, the incidence of Malignancies are not that common. Now, there are certain malignancies are common, testicular tumors, uh, uh, they occur in younger patients, uh, lymphomas and all that. But esophageal cancer usually occur after 60s. But of course, having said that, you can get the, uh, no age group is immune for esophageal cancer. But, but it is unlikely. Uh, and uh, with a three-month history of increase in difficulty in swallowing. Uh, uh, it is a little vague. Uh, it's, 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 uh, can't say very long duration. Uh, it's an intermediate duration. right? And he first noticed this problem for drinking fluids. Uh, this is a very theoretical question because even uh, most of the patients, whatever the problem, they find it, uh, they are difficulty in swallowing solids, but yes, when they say, when the Christian says they noticed the problem for uh, drinking fluids, uh, that that prompt a sort of, uh, uh, they are talking about achalasia of cardia, but it's now commonly experienced when eating food dogs. So this has also progressed, but the progress, usually progression of uh, from solids to liquids in malignancies, but theoretically they say uh, uh, the motility disorders uh, like achalasia, you get in, uh, initially you get dysphagia for liquids, then it progresses to solids, right? Uh, and uh, he has presented, uh, presented as regurgitation of food is becoming a problem and he has noticed unintentional weight loss. So, so even whatever the reason, at Calasia or CAs of Agus, if they can't eat, sort of they lose weight. Uh, just radiography show a widening of widened mediastinum. This could be mediastinal lymph nodes, but even at Calasia, you can get sort of, when you take X-ray, you get very wide mediastinum because uh, food residues in the dilated esophagus. Now, uh, esophageal carcinoma, it, it, it progresses so rapidly, sort of, there is no time for esophagus to die, uh, uh, esophagus to get dilated. Uh, so dilated esophagus you see in more chronic uh, uh, procedures. Though the patient is symptomatic for three months, this would have been there for a longer time. So this suggests that this has been there for a longer time. But other possibilities, uh, enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes. What is the most likely diagnosis? So based on these things, uh, cover test 
suggest it is achalasia, but we'll see thoracic, uh, uh, thoracic aorta aneurysm when known, eh? the thoracic artery aneurysm can be uh, So uh, it is not a very common thing, uh, and the presenting symptoms won't be this. And uh, esophageal malignancy, we said because of certain reasons, it is a bit unlikely. Plummer Wilson syndrome, there you get a web in the upper esophagus. Uh, they also get uh, difficulty in swallowing, but uh, they have difficulty in both fluids and liquids as well. And uh, the initiation of the swallowing, they find it difficult. Uh, so they don't get dilated uh, medias time. Uh, and Plummer Wilson syndrome itself is not malignant, but it's a pre malignant condition. Uh, achalasia fits into this, uh, as I discussed, uh, and achalasia also pre malignant condition. Esophageal spasms usually don't call, cause dysphagia, but they get pain when you swallow. Uh, and uh, it is uh, not a persistent thing. And uh, unlike the thing is sort of they don't lose weight. Uh, and uh, the dilated media steiner is uh, not possible with esophageal spasms. Uh, so the most likely uh, uh, reason is uh, achalasia of cardia. Sir, uh, student is... Uh, uh, there's this... Uh, yes. Thoracic uh, cardia... Thoracic yeah. aneurysms now uh, they are usually uh, not present at this yeah. stage at all. Uh, age of is not a thing. This is happening in very old divisions so after 60s. Uh, but they will present also with dysphagia. I mean, it's some sufficiently large because the thoracic carta is also sitting next to the uh, esophagus. But uh, there's another congenital cause called uh, dysphagia lusoria where you get a cerebral subclavian artery arising and then causing crossing the esophagus that and also give rise to dysphagia. But uh, this clinical picture, actually, the description that's given here is not compatible with that situation either. So, so that's one of the uh, uh, kind of a cause for dysphagia. Right. So a student has asked, if it is achalasia cardia, shouldn't it be presented much earlier? In brackets, birth. Uh, Achalasia is not a achalasia of cardia is not a congenital problem. Now it is a problem in it. It is a degenerative problem in the, uh, the in the Augsburg plexus uh, uh, in the lower end of the <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, we don't know the exact etiology, but sometimes uh, this may be post-inflammatory, sometimes post-infective as well. So it is. It doesn't present since uh, birth. Uh, so it it occurs. It's not like uh, Hirschsprung disease. It is not the mirror image of the Hirschsprung disease on the two ends of the GI tract. Right. Uh, the Hirschsprung disease is yes, it, it, you 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 are born with Hirschsprung disease. You don't get sort of Hirschsprung disease unless sort of adult uh, type of Hirschsprung disease is. Yes. But commonly, you are born with this thing. Achalasia is not like that. Uh, a student has uh, given a question to Aruna, sir. Uh, does diabetes have a protective effect for aneurysm rupture? Uh, it's not about rupture. Uh, so when somebody is having diabetes, there's a negative risk factor for the development of aneurysms. That is an association. So, except the diabetes, you almost all the other risk factors are causing that uh, um, atherosclerosis and um, aneurysms. So, uh, but um, incidence wise, uh, diabetes is a negative risk factor of the development of aneurysm. That is very well proven. Yeah. So, yeah. Not, not just a passing question uh, thinking about this unintentional weight loss. Sir. Uh, when would you uh, think that this is a, that the patient is presenting with is a significant sort of weight loss? That way, students have a loss of weight, loss of appetite. Can I think they use it fairly commonly in many patients? 
I didn't follow the question. Uh, yes, the question is about uh, when somebody is mentioning about weight loss. Yes. When do we take it as a significant weight loss? Right. That is sort of uh, in the context of percentage weight loss over the period. Now, if he has lost more than 10% of the weight over last three months, that is significant. But even if you try to sort of intentionally, if you are trying, trying some body work and uh, uh, if you are intentionally trying to lose weight, uh, then it is not considered as a significant weight loss. Or even after a major surgery, you may lose weight. Uh, so it is also not, it is, it is acceptable weight loss. Uh, after doing a bariatric procedure, you lose weight. Uh, so these are uh, in, uh, expected or accepted weight losses. Uh, but if none of these things are there, and if you lose more than 10% of weight, uh, that is considered significant. Right, okay. So last question for the day. A 63-year-old patient is admitted with a colicky right upper quadrant pain and jaundice. Abdominal ultrasound shows a thickened gallbladder but no identifiable stones. He is treated for biliary colic with fluids and analgesia but fails to improve. His serum bilirubin continues to rise as does his C-reactive protein level and white cell count. Two days after initial presentation, he develops a pyrexia of 39.2 Celsius and his pain is now constant. The next step in the management is... Right. What are the answers? Yeah. Uh, about 33% uh, has answered as MRCP. About 38% have answered uh, ERCP. Right. We discussed, uh, yeah. Uh, now, this patient uh, comes with right upper quadrant pain. 63 uh, year old man, uh, right upper quadrant pain uh, and jaundice. So, he, even at the presentation, he's hectary, right? Uh, but they say sort of they don't mention about fever at that time. So abdominal ultrasound is done. They show thickened gallbladder. So that shows sort of chronic cholecystitis, uh, thick ball gallbladder, but no stone has been detected in the gallbladder. So when the gallbladder is not distended, ultrasonically sometimes it's not easy to pick up stones, even if they are there. Sometimes there would have been a stone passed into the uh, common bile duct as well. Uh, that is also compatible because sort of he is jaundiced. Uh, and uh, the CBD colics are more true colics than sort of the uh, pain you get with the gallbladder stones. Uh, then he is treated for biliary colic. So if they have been sort of given analgesics and fluids, uh, and he has not improved. Rather, his bilirubin tend to go up and CRP is going up with the white cell count. All suggest that uh, there is an inflammatory process going on and the bilirubin also going up. And they say uh, he developed fever as well. So all suggestive of developing cholangitis, ascending cholangitis. And they say the pain is now constant. Uh, so basically, this sounds like a picture in a fairly old, uh, not a fairly old, 63 old old man uh, comes with uh, uh, having a stone in the common bile duct, very likely with cholangitis. So cholangitis is a uh, uh, cholangitis is a killer and needs urgent attention. And the best form of treatment or the, uh, the, the main intention of treating cholangitis is uh, decompressing or sort of relieve the obstruction if there is obstruction and antibiotics. Uh, so thinking of all these things in mind, 
cholecystectomy again it's a good question because uh, now the most of these stones are formed in the gall blood and get into the common bile duct even if you find the gall blood uh, stone in the common bile duct one fine day you have to do a cholecystectomy right because gall blood is the culprit otherwise he will get this problem again but this moment cholecystectomy is not going to help you have to do a cholecystectomy some day but not that is that is not going to uh, cure his this uh, serious problem at this juncture uh, yeah so if you so if you think of the you have a cover test what would you what would be your answer uh cover test my answer is erc right uh because this is a urgent situation uh you have to decompress it uh so if erc is not there uh, probably then uh the other things might consider like antibiotics mrcp uh because uh, you can uh, diagnose condition with mrcp or even with ct but it is not going to help you uh, uh, so open stone removal and t tube drainage uh, ear stone is removed and either, but it is little radical nowadays right uh, for a cbd stone with cholangitis Uh, MRI, yes, it is an invasive way of diagnosing it. If you have doubt, uh, so uh, there is a fifty-fifty between ERCP and MRCP as they have given MRC. <laughs> yeah. uh, Lithotripsy is a, a modality which is not very successful uh, in uh, biliary stones. We use it only in desperate situation. Uh, so uh, it is out anyway but it is a one modality of dealing with the uh, common bile duct stones uh, so uh, lithotripsy uh, open stone removal cholecystectomy they have uh, some place but these three are out and ercp and mrcp are on the card and uh, as uh, this is uh, Uh, i don't think sort of there is a very true answer in this question because if all these facilities are available someone would think i would do mrcp and diagnose it and then plan for ercp but you can't avoid ercp here so the the best the as they said next step of management one would think mrcp as well but it is not the definitive management so you may do mrcp but you can't stop from there you have to do a ercp uh, if there are a stone if there is a stone so the likely uh, hood underlying pathology uh, uh, the stone here i would uh, rather prefer to uh, give the answer as ercp and stone extract extract so if you, it's a small question if you do the ercp yep. and then you don't find a stone then you can avoid the er uh, er so is it uh suppose if it is due to a stricture now uh, you still decompress the biliary system isn't it so yeah but if uh, the mrcp doesn't show obstruction let's say the this is a situation where the patient had a stone in the uh, gall bladder which fell off and uh, it caused so it has passed and, uh, now yeah it has passed so you don't see a stricture or the stone but you may have a transient elevation of elliptis and the bilirubin which which will settle with time his bilirubin uh, started such a situation do you need to do the rcp uh, yeah now his bilirubin level continue to rise they say it continue to rise so in your uh, scenario uh, it tend to sort of gradually uh, settle isn't it uh, definitely it is not going to rise continue yes so true, true. Right. Uh, uh, but if the mrcp is normal would you go if the mrcp doesn't show a stricture or a stone yeah uh, if if the mrcp doesn't show a stone uh, 
and if he yeah. has sort of clinical features of cholangitis, what would you do? Uh... Yeah, I, I think this is a, a bit of a difficult question. Yeah. It will come down. Special. Yeah, Sorry? it's a difficult question. Of course, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 the students will not get sort of this kind of uh, this thing, but it is important to discuss this issue, isn't it? Yeah, I think then you learn how you how people think. Uh, yeah. so, uh, as I see this now, this is uh, okay. There's a fairly older patient coming with colicky pain. Uh, and even at the, at the beginning, the patient had jaundice. And the, and the scan has never shown a stone. So there is no stone in this, uh, in, in, in the stem, uh, but there's chicken gallbladder and he's, uh, but because of the pain, he was treated with uh, thinking that is biliary colic. So either, either there is a small stone, which you can't see in the ultrasound scan, uh, stuck in the cystic duct, or maybe there's another, there's a stone which is in the horn bile duct that is not picked up by the scan, ultrasound scan, and that is usual. Sometimes you see, yeah. You don't, uh, you don't pick up uh, small stones in the cystic duct. You don't uh, pick up small stones in the intrapancreatic part of the uh, common bile duct in ultrasound. So that is usual and uh, that's possible. Uh, and then uh, bilirubin continues to rise. So it could be, it could be a stone that is in the common bile duct that is causing pain, or it could be maybe it could be pyrimidines as well. Sometimes bit of rising bilirubin uh, with the stone cystic duct stone. And then, uh, then patient develops fever, so probably cholangitis. And uh, and uh, what you do, the the key keys for me key here is that the next step, uh, not uh, not the definite not the treatment, not the definite treatment, but next step. Oh, if I if you take all the answers, maybe cholecystectomy is out at this point because you join this patient, you are not rushing to do a cholecystectomy. You have to sort out the obstruction. Uh, ERCP will keep it aside for the moment. Uh, T tube again out uh, because you're not going to do uh, uh, now nowadays T tube exploration or T tube uh, is not used unless there are specific indications. Uh, MRI will keep because that's those are the two real uh, answers. Lithotripsy again is not something that we do for gallbladder or CBD stones uh, in the situation. So whether it's MRCP or ERCP is the question. Uh, but uh, uh, now, now here we have not seen a stone, uh, but patient has come with jaundice. So what now, um, we don't know actually the cause for jaundice. So by doing MRCP, we will get additional information for, because then, then you will know that before going for a ERCP that there's a stone and there can be something else which is causing jaundice, may not be a stone. So, and then let's say you do a ERCP and you have to put a stent and then your information is lost after that. So I think in this kind of situation, it's better to do a MRCP and then proceed for the ERCP. So that's so, probably, I think, uh, uh, would go for MRCP. In, into account when you are considering whether to do MRCP or ERCP in this kind of scenario? I didn't hear the question. What is the question, Pinto? Sir, the question is, now this patient was uh, fairly okay at the beginning and now he's having a pyrexia of 39.2 and the yeah. pain is also constant where other things are rising. Yeah. So my question is whether you take into account the time, whether you factor in time when you are considering with the MRCP yeah, or ERCP? There is, no, there is no doubt in this patient, he will need ERCP. There is no doubt in that. But then by doing by doing MRCP, uh, it will give more information before going to the ERCP. And, and, and sometimes you may be able to avoid the ERCP as well. So if you really don't see a dilatation or if you don't see a real obstruction in the good quality MRCP, you may be able to avoid. Um, and, and this is not an emergency like... Um, uh, even if you delay the ERCP for eight hours, 10 hours, still there won't be a major problem in the outcome. Uh, it's true that cholangitis is a, is a significant, uh, is, is a serious condition, but 
uh, by doing MRCP, you're not going to lose a lot of time. I mean, I'm talking about ideal situation. Uh, and you should be answering these questions in ideal situation, not in, in, uh, in uh, you know, if we have this uh, in our setup, you can't question like that. You are talking about ideal situation. And then if you... Ideal situations. Yeah, yeah. If you are, if you start talking about uh, suboptimal situation, it can be quite variable. Some sub suboptimal situation will never be able to do MRC. In another place, you might be able to do MRCP after some time. So you should be talking about ideal situation, I think. This patient pops up, up in a peripheral hospital where our students, some of our students may work as house officers. What would you suggest to them, sir? Now, peripheral hospital, the best thing is to transfer this patient. Uh, but very unlikely they have either facilities, MRCP and uh, ERC. No, I think I think when you are when we are setting up questions, uh, we should yeah. be set up questions for uh, different places. You are, should set up questions. We are setting up questions for standard management. Ideal setups. Yes. Yeah. Then then in your practice you should be sensible to you practice according to the place. Sure. So you can set up questions to different places. Agree. Uh, and uh, this is a very good question, I think, because we can discuss a lot. Yeah. Uh, yes. uh, as 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 Rohan said, I would change my uh, answer as well now for MRCP. Uh, my reason to do ERCP was because very likely he needs a ERCP whether you do MRCP or not. But yeah. Sort of going in with more information and uh, gathering that information. Uh, 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 I, so important, vital piece of information, I think, uh, is more important. Uh, so I, I would also take uh, MR, MRCP. Rohan, um, this stem says that the patient has a, a kind of, uh, in this scan says there's a sort of thickened gallbladder, yeah. but uh, without identifiable stone. Doesn't it mean that there has been a stone definitely and which has passed now? Now, in that situation, now also the patient is deteriorating. So, yeah. two days after the initial presentation, you have a pyrex, yes, high fever, and pain is now constant. That means that cholangitis is now is something which we have to treat. Right? Now, it is an obstructed, infected system. So, in that situation, is it better to go for ERCP as soon as I said initially? Yeah, uh, the, the uh, point is, uh, I don't know, there's no doubt that he will require ERCP. Is there any harm in doing it as first there is line? Harm. There is harm because ERCP, uh, now ERCP, all these are invasive procedures. Yeah. Yeah. Then ERCP carries a risk. ERCP can aggravate cholangitis. If, let's say, um, and, and, and on top of this, if he gets pancreatitis, there, there is a risk. So, mm -hmm. so there is a risk. And there is no harm in doing a ERCP. Actually, it might help the ERCP. If you do MRCP before that, it mm -hmm. might help the ERC because then you know there is a stone in, impacted in the heart, in, in the distal, distal part of the common bile duct, or you know that they, this is not a stone, that this is a stricture. So mm -hmm. that, that helps the ERCP. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make a big difference, delay to, to do a ERCP. Let's say even in this patient, to, to get the patient to the ERCP, it will take at least six to eight hours to get a ERCP. In fact, in, in, in even in ideal situation, so you don't just rush a patient to ERCP. You know? Yeah. So during that time, uh, we can get MRCP and until the time patient is optimized, you can get MRCP and then go for the ERCP. And the uh, other thing is, uh, what I said later, this old patient, this could even be a, a tumor. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Uh, mm. so, so, I would rather do a CT-MRCP combo if yes. it is that's there. Right. That's the best. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so if if it is a, a tumor, uh, you probably may not do a ERCP. We may think of doing a, some other way of decompressing. Yes. Uh, uh, so MRCP gives some valuable information uh, with uh, with without any. Uh, it's it's a fairly non-invasive way of getting more information. So I fully agree with uh, Rohan and sort of I withdraw my answer. And and when you do a ERCP, sometimes the information is lost. If you have to do a put a stent 
after the ERCP, uh, then after that you can't go and do a MRCP and a, uh, and a CT because then you don't see the, when you have a stent inside the common bile duct, you don't see all the information because the, the whole picture is blurred. Uh, you get you don't get a real uh, good good quality picture when you have a stent inside the common bile duct. So, so subsequent CT and MRCP will not give you the information that is required. Are postgraduate listening or sort of are they uh, with us or? With us, sir. Huh? Sir, uh, another student has asked just now. Uh, sir, does it mean if ultrasound shows a stone? Can we go straight away to ERCP without doing MRCP? Uh, if ultrasound shows evidence of a stone in the common bile duct. Evidence of a stone. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. I think in that situation, yes. So yes. you have evidence. You know yeah. that the block is because of a stone and you have seen a stone. Uh, I think in that situation, yes. Yeah. So can we do PTC in this patient? Yeah, okay. P uh, PTC in this situation. Yeah, PTC. Uh, so basically from uh, PTC, um, what you can do is you can, you can have a look at the biliary tree. Uh, the same thing that you gain from MRCP. Uh, and, uh, and the other additional thing that you get from a PTEC is that uh, you can put an external biliary drain. So if you want to, if your idea is to look at the biliary tree, then of course MRCP is the choice. But then if you want to drain the biliary tree after having looked at the biliary tree, then you have two options. One is to do a ERCP and other one is to do a, uh, uh, PTC, but out of these two options, if he has a stone, you can't remove a stone with a PTC. So, if, but sometimes if the patient, if the patient is quite sick, where he can't undergo ERCP with sedation or with, if he is too sick to undergo a procedure, in these kind of situations, to drain, to drain the biliary tree, we might, uh, we might do a PTC. But if the patient is fit enough, then the better option is to go for a ERCP. Students, any more questions? A 45-year-old female is investigating. Yes, duration. A 45-year-old female is investigated for dysphagia for two years duration. Hmm. Endoscopy shows no lesions. Hmm. What is the most appropriate next investigation? Right. They now, have given some investigations. The... What do you think? Yeah, now, now uh, I think quite correctly the, the patient comes with dysphagia had uh, endoscopy as the first line investigation, right? And it doesn't show any evidence of luminal lesion, right? So we have to accept that there is no luminal lesion. So the next possibility, considering the age and the duration of dysphagia, is a motility disorder, right? So the next uh, most appropriate investigation, I would say, is uh, manometry, esophageal manometry. Uh, if esophageal manometry is not in the answer uh, answers, the, the second next would be the. Uh, be contrast solo with uh, image intensifier. That's a real time contrast solo. Uh, yeah, they, but the answer the answer was the barium solo. That's what it was given, not the HRM monitoring. Uh, uh, but ideally, is uh, HRM, high resolution no, But if it is not there, I would take uh, contrast Very solo with contrast time solo. monitoring. Yes. Yeah, into the measuring yard, we will take only verbal questions, not the type questions. Cutting on the crowd through the end of it.
దాస్ అఫి మేకర్ నే అఫి వి ఆర్ ప్లానింగ్ టు ఐ గెట్ క్లోజర్ టు స్టూడెంట్స్ ఐ మీన్ అకడమికలీ యా బట్ దే ఆర్ నాట్ టేకింగ్ ది ఆపర్చునిటీ టేకింగ్ ఎవరి టుడే హౌ మెనీ స్టూడెంట్స్ హావ్ పార్టిసిపేటెడ్ ది దే హావ్ అబౌట్ 230 అట్ ది బిగినింగ్ నౌ దేర్ ఇస్ 178 రోహాన్సర్ల <laughs> Uh, so you will not get these questions meka dan liya gena kata padan karana uttara ekak ganna kata wedak wenne no that is not the idea of these questions so don't study the questions and and also can you all just uh, uh, respond and tell whether this pattern of teaching is better than doing a taking a topic and discussing uh, uh, so what type of uh, classes do you all like you all like uh, classes based on these questions or not classes discussions based on these questions or do you like um do you like uh, uh, uh formal question based question based formal. yeah yeah so just put up your response in the in the group so that we can do some i'll send them a google form as well sir tomorrow ah okay so right. they can more formally and more but if they want this type of thing their actual participation is more important Okay sir. Thank you sir. Thank you sir. Thank you sir.